Well, hello there, and good morning, evening, and afternoon to everybody around the world. My name is Mikko. I am the Chief Research Officer for F-Secure, and this is today's webinar on cybersecurity and COVID-19. What are the effects of the coronavirus pandemic on our field of the world? For us who work in data security or infosec, or maybe the CIOs around the world, or just anybody who happens to be watching. Thanks for joining us today. Just before we started, we had around 1,000 people online from all over the world, and we estimate the number to grow during the webinar. And I want to send my best wishes and greetings to everybody around the world during these unusual times. And it's hard to overestimate just how unusual times these are. I mean, this is a truly and really global event. And this is historic. This is the single biggest news item of the decade. It will become one of the defining moments of the century. This will be mentioned over and over again in history books. And when I say it is a global event, that's really what it is. This does affect pretty much everybody around the world. It affects every single country around the world. And things like these never happen. We very rarely have incidents which affect every country on the planet. The pandemic we have right now is exactly like that. Even the world wars we had decades ago, they really weren't this global. They were countries which were neutral, which were not part of the war. Well, this is a war which affects every country. So right now, everybody is sitting in their homes, just like me, sitting in their homes, feeling isolated and maybe desperate and scared. And I guess it's okay to be scared. It's okay to understand that these are unusual times. And I think many of us feel helpless and useless. We'd like to help somehow. We'd like to be part of the solution, but we feel there's very little we can do about this. And we might also feel useless because when we realize that we would be spending days and weeks, maybe even months in our own homes, I guess most of us, including me, had big hopes for, you know, that now I finally have the time to do these things. I, I finally have time to be productive. And now after some time in isolation, I don't think we've been very productive. And I think it's fair to say to all of us that it's okay. It's okay even if you're not that productive because we are in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, I'll be frank, I had high hopes of doing great work on writing a book I've been trying to write. I haven't been productive on that at all. It's just so hard to concentrate on something like that when we are living in the middle of a pandemic. And I guess it's okay. That's the way it goes. And these are unusual times for companies. Many companies are struggling because all the clients have disappeared. The companies which can have their workforce work remotely have taken the unusual step of pretty much sending everybody home. And we can see this from statistics. So here's the statistics from Shodan showing just the growth rate in uh, remote desktop ports over the last, uh, last weeks. So it's clear that the whole world has gone um, remote. So let's first speak a little bit about remote workforce and what does it mean, especially from the point of view of IT leadership and CIOs and CTOs. So everybody goes home. Everybody takes their work equipment home, not just their laptops. And we've used laptops being remotely connected to, to the office with VPNs. People are taking their desktops home. Many people take their monitors and work chairs home, which is a great idea for ergonomics and should be supported. But then it poses questions like how good is the security of the network they are being connected to? Like, do the home users have a password on their Wi-Fi? Do the home users have a password on their home router? How good are those passwords? Are they crackable by bots which go around the world every minute looking for weak passwords and routers? Did you tell your employees to check the password on these things? Because if you didn't, 
they are completely new remote holes in your corporate network as you now have desktops sitting in homes connected to internet routers with weak passwords. Now, obviously everybody's now using VPNs for communication. Once again, you now have devices which didn't need VPNs, like, like uh, corporate desktops, which are no longer at the office. At the office, they don't need a VPN. Now they are at homes. What about VPN connectivity from your employees' iPhones and iPads and Android devices? Do they have VPNs? Are they online? Things to consider. Same thing with your uh, routines for updating your, your uh, employees. The operating systems updates for home users should be enabled. Application updates should be monitored and deployed. Maybe even This is maybe even more important right now than in, in normal times. And then the practical things, the fact that now these work devices are in the middle of the family. So it's all too easy for the dad to give their work laptop to a kid to install some games, which obviously is problematic. Or the fact that users might be accessing entertainment from their work device, whether it's watching Netflix or adult entertainment or just surfing on dodgy websites. This is an education problem, and I think it's fairly easy for employees to understand the point of um, keeping good care of your tools, being proud of keeping your tools in order. And these are our tools. Our laptops and our phones are the tools of the corporate workforce today. Now, it's very easy for companies to restrict access over VPNs to sites. And for example, you could easily use our tools and our products to block, for example, YouTube. Now, I don't actually recommend that. I mean, I only recommend it if, if there's no other way to keep your VPNs running if you're really low on bandwidth. YouTube actually is quite often a corporate tool. I watch tons of corporate videos, I mean, stuff that's relevant to my work from YouTube. Sure, there's tons of entertainment there as well, but just bluntly blocking YouTube isn't that obvious. It's much more easier blocking access on your corporate VPN to places like Netflix or Twitch or Steam, which clearly are entertainment environments. YouTube, it's a tough call. And another tough call for corporations right now is what to do about Zoom. The Zoom is being used by people all over the world to do video conference conferencing right now. It's exploding in user base. Your employees are using Zoom, whether you like it or not, whether you think they're using Zoom or not. And yes, you might have, you know, some Cisco corporate system or teams that you expect everybody to use. And some of your employees will use that, but some of them will use Zoom because it's easy to use and ease of use always wins. Zoom is quickly becoming a verb. You know, can you Google that? Let's zoom on that. That's what's happening. It's, it's becoming the norm and it's kind of hard to fight. Now, from my point of view, as a security person, Zoom isn't the end of the world. Sure, Zoom has had some security problems over the last two years, including, you know, they were installing a web server on Mac OS X by default. And it was hiding the fact that there was a web server running and that could have been used to run code on, on Mac laptops. They fixed that, but there, there has been issues. There's a couple of known issues which Zoom has fixed over the last months or over the last year. But right now, the biggest problems with Zoom really aren't about data security or info security or exploits or any of that. There's worries about privacy. Sure, if you read through Zoom um, terms, it's not very good about what they promised to do with your private data. We know they've been sending information to Facebook, whether they did it on purpose or not, we don't know that. But it's not really security, it's more in the privacy area. And then there's practical things to do when you use Zoom yourself for setting up meetings. There's a couple of points to take home on using Zoom uh, safely, because you don't want outsiders to join your meetings or sabotage your meetings or or just listen in so don't share your meeting ids publicly and there's two types of zoom meeting ids it's either nine numbers which is random gets regenerated every time you set up a new meeting or it's a permanent nickname for a room which you can generate if you have a permanent place um, either one don't share it publicly if you've shared a room name publicly 
you might consider changing it or just make sure you always have a password on your meeting so outsiders can join in. Also realize that outsiders can join a Zoom meeting without a password, without joining the video. They can actually call in with a traditional phone and listen in to what's being discussed. Be aware that this can be done for any Zoom meeting. Then also make sure that you, that you only allow the host to share their screens, especially for a passwordless meeting. Otherwise, anybody can join in and share whatever, and we've seen people do this. Uh, if you want to have someone else share their screen, you can make them the host during the meeting, then they can share their screen. There's a setting for disallowing participants which have been kicked out of a Zoom so that they cannot rejoin. That's a good idea. You can disable file transfers. You should assume that anything you type in the chat will become public sooner or later. And you don't want to click on funky links in Zoom chat. Uh, in Zoom chat. And I hear you wondering, what is a dodgy link? Well, here's an example of a dodgy link. This is a real example. If you actually send a link like that to someone, they click on it, it, it will execute a file on their local computer. Of course, this can be weaponized by, you know, doing something a little bit more creative, but things like these can be done. And to understand or to underline the point about not sharing your public IDs, just don't share them. Another thing I want to talk about today is hoaxes. Now, hoaxes during crises are not new. We've seen them over and over again. And it's kind of weird that whenever we have some kind of crisis, we see a lot of um, hoaxes going around over email or over different social media. I don't know what it is about crises, but it always seems to happen and it's happening again. Now, this is something we have to give guidance to all the time and you have to give guidance to your contacts and employees and the guidance is pretty simple if you get a warning about something over email or social media think twice before you forward it and if you decide to forward it don't just blindly forward a warning forward a link to a trustworthy source because whenever hoaxes go around and there's an example of a text message or whatsapp hoax in the screen they never have links to sources. They just talk about that BBC is warning about this, but there's no link to BBC. And of course, BBC really isn't warning about this. And just like hoaxes come around whenever something big is happening, we see um, other problems as well. And while I'm continuing with this webcast, I want to remind you that we're taking questions and I'm answering your questions right after this, this webcast. I expect to go on for another 20 minutes after that we'll go to the chat and i'll be able to read questions you leave to the chat it's not an interactive chat you won't be able to see what others are saying but i will go through and i'll take 10 15 minutes to answer your questions after the chat so that should be uh, something where you can just leave leave the notes so another thing which always happens during crises is that online criminals start to take advantage of this um, this is most obvious in email and spam and phishing campaigns. Whatever big news item happens in hours, we'll start seeing spam campaigns and phishing campaigns which capitalize on the news item. The last time we saw this in large scale was during the Kobe Bryant tragedy. And we immediately started seeing both spam and phishing attacks using Kobe Bryant messages or Kobe Bryant themed messages to try to trick users into clicking on links and this is happening all the time um, we've seen plenty of spam campaigns sending emails which talk about COVID-19 or coronavirus or you know cure for COVID-19 and when people follow the links from these sites they end up to a page which asks them to log on to their Gmail or Google Docs or Outlook or something like that the worst examples we've seen have actually been um, telling messages about how you could have been infected yourself because your colleague or friend or family member has been infected and it seems to be coming from a medical expert. And these are, of course, scary messages. And when people get scared, it's much easier for them to click on links or open up attachments without thinking it through. The attackers know this. This is why it happens every time we see an outbreak. In this particular message, uh, they attached an Excel spreadsheet, which is then supposed to contact the information about how you have been exposed 
to the COVID-19 uh, virus through a colleague. And because of security purposes, the Excel file has been encrypted. So you have to enable content to see the secure content. And of course, this is bollocks. It's just trying to infect you. And if we look really carefully at the Excel file, we'll actually see an example on how the end users would could be able to tell the difference between a legitimate message or just a scam being sent out by scam artists. There's plenty of other examples of this going around, um, how your neighbor tested positive or how the World Health Organization has announced a cure or a solution. Just open the attachment to see what it is or how a member of your staff has been infected and there's an HTML file with the details. Now, the advice is always the same. Think twice before you click on links. Think twice before you open attachments. Think twice when you get an unexpected login and double check that you really are on the site that you think you are. And this might not be just on your computer. We've seen plenty of these cases happening over text messages and over WhatsApp as well. These have been happening uh, also in, in, uh, in TikTok and, and Telegram and others. And I guess that brings us sort of back to the point about Zoom. Um, it's really hard for um, security departments or, or um, infosec people to try to fight against applications which are becoming organically popular, like Zoom is becoming organically globally popular right now. Um, people will use them uh, regardless of what you say. And if the product is good enough, if it's a great application, People will use it regardless of the privacy implications. Zoom is a great app. It has great usability. People will use it. Telegram is another example. There's been plenty of discussions about how Telegram doesn't encrypt all the content in the way users think they are encrypted, but it's a great product. It works very well. People will use it. Same thing with TikTok. Same thing with, uh, I don't know, Huawei mobile phones. Basically, same thing with Google. We all know that Google products are great. It, they really make great products. We just can't pay for the products with money, so we have to pay with our data. So when we look at the examples of the scams we see on mobile messaging, like WhatsApp or text or iMessage scams, well, here's an example. Um, we all know governments are issuing uh, money to help small companies or renters or small business owners or just citizens to cope. And the scammers are using that. You know, click here to get your free money. And then when you click the link, you end up on a phishing website, which might look very real, but it's not real. It might even, you know, list the URL, in this case, gov.uk at the very top. But if you look at the real URL at the very, very top, it's not a government address at all. And there's been plenty of examples of this, whether the uh, cases are in UK or in Canada or wherever. This isn't a problem which is, is going to go away anytime soon either. So then let's talk about attacks against medical organizations themselves. In particular, I wanna speak about ransomware attacks against medical organizations. Now, this is a delicate problem. Medical organizations are fragile targets for cyber attacks. They've always been fragile targets. One of the practical reasons why medical organizations and hospitals find, find it hard to defend their network is that many of these are public organizations funded by countries or cities or counties, and they quite often are under very strict budget control. They have tons of things to spend their money on. One of them is IT, and it's kind of hard to keep your IT in top-notch shape running the latest and greatest hardware and the latest operating system with full patches if you have very strict budget control. And this is the reason why we regularly see legacy systems being used in medical organizations and being used in hospitals. We see plenty of Windows 7 machines, for example, and Windows 7 is out of support. So Windows 7 is no longer getting security patches. We even see Windows XP controlling medical devices. And in, in uh, particular, when we speak about ransomware attacks, attacks where systems are locked down and there's a demand for payment to make systems 
uh, become available again. Well, the criminals do realize that, you know, these are critical, critical organizations and they're willing, maybe more willing to pay the ransoms. Um, in fact, in a brand new Europol uh, um, bulletin, they, they mentioned this in particular. Hospitals and other healthcare facil facilities are considered profitable targets for ransomware. This is what the criminals think. And the fact is, if you look at any modern medical organization or any modern hospital, computers are everywhere. I was looking at the remarkable footage shot by Sky News in northern Italy as they were visiting hospitals filled with coronavirus patients. And every time they were showing these heroic medical experts, nurses and doctors at their work, wherever you looked, you would always see a computer or two. It was always a laptop next to a patient, which contained the information about the patient and what kind of care the patient has been receiving. And then typically another computer controlling the uh, ICU units or the ventilation computers or whatever. So computers run our modern hospitals, just like computers run everything else, every single factory, every single power plant. The fact is that when we get these great new innovations, like modern computer systems or just the internet, they very quickly make us reliant on those technologies. Think about the electricity grid. We got electricity in widespread use around 150 years ago. Electricity changed our world. Electricity made our cities possible. And of course, we became very, very reliant on electricity. Today, when the power goes out, everything goes down. Well, exactly the same thing is happening right now with the Internet. In very near future, we will be exactly as reliant on Internet being up as we are right now reliant on power being up. And when Internet goes down, everything will go down. Just like today, if power goes down, everything goes down. Clearly, we've gotten great benefits from the Internet. We've gotten so much better efficiency, so much business, so much connectivity, so much entertainment. But at the very same time, we are so reliant on it. It's exposing us to completely new kinds of risks. And when we look at statistics from medical organizations, just in the United States, there's been so many cases of data leaks from medical organizations. And we've seen over and over again cases where medical research organizations or hospitals have been targeted by ransomware cases. We've seen them over the last couple of years, but we've also seen them right during this outbreak. So if we look at the timeline of some of the cases we know of, um, we've seen these in all parts of the world, all the way from United States to France to Canada to Australia or to Germany, hospitals are getting hit. Whether they're getting hit with a targeted attack or whether they just become part of a larger campaign where the attacker is just scanning networks to find vulnerable organization and they happen to find hospital or medical organizations because their systems aren't fully up to date, it could be either one. The, nevertheless, we keep see, seeing organizations getting hit by ransomware. And some of these organizations didn't survive. The latest case I know of was in the very end of last year, where a California-based um, medical organization shut down their operations because of a ransomware attack. They didn't recover. It was a small local clinic, but the bottom line is that they went bankrupt and they had to shut down their operations because of a ransomware. And this is rare. Organizations almost never go bankrupt just because they get hit by a cyber attack. But sometimes it does happen for real. And here is one example of that happening for real. So what's been happening now over the last two to three weeks as the pandemic has become, well, as, it, as the pandemic has been declared a pandemic. So there has been attacks. However, we aren't seeing a massive growth in attacks. So we aren't seeing ransomware gangs, you know, targeting hospitals in large scale just because of the pandemic. That isn't happening. 
we aren't seeing zero cases either. So it's sort of business as usual. It's not really going up or down. Of course, we wish it would be going down. In fact, it should be going down because who the hell targets hospitals with ransomware attacks in the middle of a global pandemic? Like, what the hell? Like, wh what are these people thinking? It makes no sense whatsoever. Even if it's easy money to be made, now is not the time to make easy money. The whole world is suffering. So when we look at some of the cases during the pandemic, we have seen organizations which have been targeted. Some of these are hospitals. Some of these are medical research organizations. Both of them are important at this time. Obviously, hospitals are saving lives as we speak, but the medical research organizations are trying to find a cure. We need both. And neither of these kinds of organizations should be targeted by attacks like these. And some of these attacks are really... Uh, well, we can make no excuses for them. If you look at the attack against Spanish hospitals, which we saw a week ago, exactly a week ago, this was targeting Spanish hospitals, and the attachment was called coronavirus underscore COVID 19.vps. Like, this is no accident. They knew exactly what they were doing. Now, some ransomware gangs have stood down. Um, I believe I tweeted like 10, 12 days ago a public message to ransomware gangs, basically saying what I just told you. Like, now is not the time. Just if you go after ransom, if you go after hospitals with ransomware attacks during the pandemic, you will be hunted down. And some ransomware gangs actually made public statements saying that they would stood down. They wouldn't attack medical organizations. Now, of course, we can't trust the word of organized criminals, but nevertheless, that is the right message. That's what we would hope we would see. And you might be wondering, um, how does this actually work? So let's take some examples. Uh, first, some of the uh, cases that we see here on the screen. This is the Brno um, Hosp University Hospital in, in Czech Republic, as, as they were shut down because of a ransomware attack. This is the public notice on Twitter from Ili um, This is the... Um, yeah, in Illinois. Oh, that's right. Um, so we might be wondering, how do we actually see these messages from these ransomware gang? Well, some of them have communication mechanisms. Some of them you can actually email. And this is because these criminals need to be able to communicate with their victims to organize the payments, and in some cases, to give tech support to their victims who have paid to help them recover their files. So you can actually reach these gangs, and sometimes they talk to security people. Some of these gangs actually have public websites. So um, this is the Maze Team, which is a ransomware gang um, from their website, where they actually announced on March 18th that we also stop all activity versus all kinds of medical organizations until the stabilization of the situation with the virus. And this was on the 18th of March. Now, the reason why Maze Gang runs a public website like this is that this is how they twist the hands of the victims they've infected who refused to pay. They have a public website on the internet, not in the dark web, in public internet, which anybody can access, where they will post information about their victims who won't pay. And if they still won't pay, then they will start posting files stolen from these victims. So it's a way of twisting the arm of the victims to try to make them pay, even if they don't want to pay. And on the Maze website, and I know you can now see the URL of the Maze website at the top line. It's, it's an IP address, which I don't recommend you to visit. Or if you visit it, don't, don't visit it from an insecure device. If you don't know what you're doing, don't go to this website because there's no guarantees what's on the website. They actually posted a medical organization among their victims uh, on this website. However, the date when they posted this was on the 14th of March. Um, then they announced on the 18th of March that they will stop all attacks against medical organizations. However, two days later, they posted files from this organization to try to twist them to pay. So it's clearly mixed messages. Another victim they've had, um, another uh, medical organizations that have been targeted by ransomware gangs have also been victims of having their files posted to public internet 
um, in order to twist their arm into paying the ransoms. And this is what we don't want to see. So again, my message to ransomware gangs is that please stand down. Wake the F up. Do not target hospitals. If you do, we will use all the resources we have to hunt you down. The global cybersecurity community will come after you. And I'm really happy to see how we are now seeing the cybersecurity community getting together and working together to do what we can do to help. And I guess we should be happy that there is something we can do because the whole world is sitting in their homes feeling useless and scared and helpless. But those of us who work with computer security, well, we can help. We can be part of the solution and we should be part of the solution. We can help the medical organizations to do their work better. We can help the hospitals to keep their computers up and running. And my message to medical organizations and hospitals who are struggling with computer problems right now is that all you need to do is ask. The cyber community around the world is more than willing to help. And my message to you is that these are really unusual times. This is global, more global than anything else that has happened during our lifetime. It affects every country on the planet, every city on the planet, almost every human on the planet. Things like these never happen. It's one of the biggest news item, items of the century, and it's happening right now. Thank you for joining us today. Again, my name is Mikko. I'm the Chief Research Officer for F-Secure. Let's see how many people we've had in the stream. Maybe I'll get a number here on our uh, chat. Mm. No, actually, I don't see that. Now we're going to go to questions and answers. So uh, let's see what kind of questions we've been getting. And I'll take like 10 to 15 minutes to go through the questions we have, if we have interesting questions here. So let's see. Mm. Question from Aaron. Is it possible the bad guys are getting in and laying low until better economic times? Also, I'm very concerned about mobile device attacks and the multi-factor apps that run on them. Well, that's, that's a good question. Like, I hate the way you think, Aaron. It's perfectly possible that cyber criminals do what they do all the time, try to find weak machines to gain access to and when they gain access to these machines they might not launch their attacks right now today just because it looks bad and they just maintain access and uh, will uh, then maybe access these systems later yeah could happen and i just got the number we've had 1730 people in the stream so thanks for all of you for joining the stream today all right let's have a look then we have a question um, about what should hospitals do? Just a second. Yeah. Okay. That, I just lost that question. Let's let's take another one. <clears throat> is there any indication of that cyber criminals are weaponizing information what is gathered to track COVID nineteen spreading? We haven't heard any of that. Um, and there's tons of information being shared by uh, everybody who's involved in trying to find a fix. And of course, that's what we are supposed to do. Open data helps in times like these. And I'm sure there's downsides as well. Um, one thing that many people are doing right now to help is that they're participating in a project called Folding at Home, which I recommend. Folding at Home is a way of combining networks of thousands or hundreds of thousands of home computers to build a supercomputer which then does things like DNA analysis or genome analysis in large scale which can be used directly to help trying to find a cure 
for COVID-19. So if you have extra computing power that you control, you can help by joining uh, Folding at Home project. However, if you do join Folding at Home, you have to be careful that you download the Folding at Home application from the official Folding at Home website, because we have already seen Trojanized versions of the Folding at Home client. Obviously, they don't come from the official website. So that's my guidance there. Then we have a question um, or from Yusef about Zoom. So if Zoom is not fully secure, uh, what is the best secure meeting platform? Again, Zoom doesn't have that many security problems. There's more privacy problems and then problems of using it wrongly, including opening up meetings with no password with a public meeting ID, which then means anybody can listen in or join in and sabotage your meeting. Um, it's kind of hard to really list them according to what would be the most secure one. Right now, it seems that many corporate environments are targeting towards Teams. And Microsoft nowadays has a very good track record in keeping their platforms safe and fixing vulnerabilities very quickly as they are found. Okay, another question. This is from Frizo. We have our programs running in the cloud, therefore we don't see a need for a VPN. Now, that's a very good point. What, what are the um, things that we have to pay extra attention on? If you are running a fully, fully cloud environment, you don't need a VPN. Um, reportedly, this is the way, for example, Google runs internally. There, there is no internal network. There is no VPN that you could use to gain access to internal network because there is none. Everybody's using Google Docs. Everybody's using uh, Google Mail. And every, everything is in the cloud. Um, yeah, then you don't need a VPN. Then you have to pay attention to monitoring for abnormal traffic within your cloud environments, which can be done as well, but it's sort of a different problem. Now, most organizations today are not yet there. Most organizations are somewhere in the middle. They still have the old systems where they need VPNs for internal networks and they run some cloud environments for some purposes. I guess some organizations, maybe even most organizations, will stay in that hybrid environment for years and decades. There is no need to go fully cloud, but some organizations are doing that. And it's clearly obvious that uh, startups embrace cloud from the beginning. And as, as startups grow and become big companies, they will never have an internal network because they've been cloud first from the very beginning. All right. Um, Questions. This is from Kalle. Hello, Kalle. If a company has only basic virus protection, what program would be the next must-have program and why? For example, EDR. EDR, threat scanning program or mobile protection. Well, you don't mention VPNs. I would mention VPNs as the next step, but I'm assuming uh, most organizations are very familiar with VPNs as well. The next step would be EDRs. But Again, the question is how large is your, is your organization? So when you have uh, endpoint uh, protection, which goes beyond traditional antivirus systems, it does require more maintenance. It does mean that you probably have to have a dedicated IT department unless you're willing to outsource all of your uh, security management. But yeah, EDR would be the next step. Okay. Question from MM. Apart from COVID phishing campaigns, are there any other COVID-specific attacks? Well, I gave you a couple of examples, including the targeted attachments, the Visual Basic scripts, which were themed with COVID messaging to make it more likely people would click on them. So we are seeing attacks like that already. Um, message from Senat. Can you compare the COVID-19 infection and the worst of the virus infections we've met so far? No, no, I can't. Sure, we use medical terms in our line of work. We speak about viruses and worms and retroviruses and polymorphic viruses. But that's it. We're just stealing the terms from the real experts who came up with them in the first place during the research for medical environments. Computer viruses are not medical viruses. There's some similarities in the way they spread around the world, but I don't think it's very useful to try to compare them. Today's malware spreads over the network, so there's no geographical distribution there at all. 
There are some similarities in growth rates when you look at things like USB-borne malware, which only spreads when people travel. So USB worms spread from one computer to another. When you put a USB thumb drive into a computer, it gets infected, and then you physically carry the thumb drive to another computer. So the only way a USB worm spreads from one country to another is that somebody travels from that country to another carrying an infected thumb drive. And there, the infection rates are very, very similar to flu or to COVID-19. Um, but is there anything we could learn from that? I don't think so. I mean, we are just stealing terminology from the medical experts and we uh, appreciate the work of the real experts in this place, the medical experts, greatly. Okay, I'll take um, two more questions. Let's see what do we have here. Oh, quite a few questions, actually. Um, Is there any regional APT campaigns using um, COVID messaging? Well, yes, there are. We are seeing attacks which we believe are coming from nation states, which are now using COVID-19 messaging as the cover to gain access to organizations, which is, we have a term for this. This is known as a dick move. Like even if you are a foreign intelligence agency and you realize that people are scared and they're more likely to click on links or open attachments, which are themed on the pandemic, it's still a dick move and you shouldn't be doing that either. But the answer to your question is that, yes, we are, we are seeing some nation states use these in attacks. A couple of examples already exists. Um, question, hi Mikko, many hospitals or public institutions don't have a lot of money to push good IT security. Yeah, that is the, the explanation why hospitals often have so many legacy systems and why they seem to have uh, in many cases outbreaks which they shouldn't be having in the first place. We saw this very well during WannaCry in 2017 and with NHS, uh, the National Health Service of the United Kingdom. United Kingdom's health service was under a very strict budget control for years and they were running outdated systems. Well, after WannaCry hit them, they had to cancel 19,500 medical appointments. They had to cancel 600 surgeries because of that. After WannaCry, they did get the budget increases. Of course, because we every, everybody saw, even the politicians saw just how bad it is. But it did take such a tragedy before they realized. And we can clearly do better. So thank you for your questions. Everybody stay safe. Everybody remember that you wash your hands. Don't get sicko. This is Miko. I'll see you. Thank you very much.